Hello and welcome to the online worship for the Ceredigion Methodist Circuit. It's good to have you here worshipping with us. We are more than halfway through Bible Month looking at Revelation. It's been a challenge to everybody, but I hope a good one. Now, Revelation is punctuated by outbursts of praise. And so I've taken one of these from chapter 10 as our call to worship. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you to worship you. We come with all your people on heaven and on earth to lift up our hearts and our voices, to give the praise and honour due, due to you, our God and King. We praise you for our world, all the beauty of your creation. We praise you for the life you have given us, so full of blessing. We praise you for all you have done in Christ, for the richness of life you offer through him. We praise you for your love upon which we can depend, your love which is always with us. So almighty God, accept our worship, touch our hearts with the nearness of your presence, deepen our faith, strengthen our commitment, broaden our vision, so that we may grow as your people and play our part in working for your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we have our first hymn, Angel Voices Ever Singing.
So as in other weeks, we will now have a short video introducing week three, witness, worship and waiting. Parts of Revelation are a bit like a comic book, full of larger than life characters and dramatic action sequences. There are earthquakes, thunderstorms and other terrifying events. There are dragons, sea monsters and land beasts all causing destruction and mayhem, pain and confusion. And in the midst of it all are God's people. Following Jesus isn't always easy. Sometimes we feel under pressure, confused or even threatened by the world around us. Revelation was written to encourage us to stay faithful, to keep worshipping, keep shining our light and keep telling the world about God, even when that might be scary or difficult or painful. How might we hold on to Jesus and offer hope to others when things around us get chaotic? Prayers of adoration and confession, followed by the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of all, we come to proclaim your greatness, to sing of your might, to declare your majesty and to rejoice in all that you have done. We come to hear again of your great acts across history, your wonderful deeds amongst your people, all you have accomplished in Christ. We come to lift up our hearts, to lift up our voices and to celebrate again the gospel. But as we bring our praise, so also we bring our confession. Confession that too often our praise has been hollow, our worship restricted to Sundays and to the four walls of our church. That when the chance has come to speak for you, we have kept silent. And when the opportunity has arisen to serve you, we have held back. That when we have known what we should do, we have failed to do it. And when we have known what not to do, we have gone ahead and done it anyway. Merciful God, forgive us now for failing to practice what we preach, for denying what we proclaim by the way we live, for letting you down in so many ways through our weak and feeble discipleship. So help us to live in such a way that our words and actions may be one and our faith seem to be real. And so may all we say and all we do and all we are witness to you and the wonder of your love shown through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You are a God of love and mercy and we praise you. In his name. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 to 11. Then the voice from heaven spoke to me again. Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. 
Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet in my mouth, but when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. Last week we were on chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, with John observing the throne room of heaven, containing all the elders and the four creatures, all of them in ceaseless rounds of praise to the Lamb who had been slain, who was sat on the throne of God. Well, since then, a lot has happened in Revelation including some affirmation of God's people and, let's call it, refining of the earth. And so we come to chapter 10, which begins with John witnessing a mighty angel coming down from heaven, holding the little scroll in his hand. It's the same scroll as we saw in chapter 5, the scroll that only the lamb could open. The scroll that contained God's plans and the new thing for the earth. The mighty angel proceeds to plant one foot in the sea and one foot on the land. Helen Miller writes that one way to hear what a biblical text is saying is to highlight things within it like repetition. And the positioning of the angel's feet in this chapter is repeated three times. A few verses later, the angel goes on to swear by the one who has created the heavens and all that is in them and the earth and all that is in it. All this positioning of feet and acclamation is to emphasise that God is sovereign over heaven and earth. Actually, God's people are going to need to know this wonderful truth as persecution is coming. In a couple of chapters, John will be describing this persecution using coded language. Remember, these writings were for the eyes of God's people only, and it would have been dangerous for them to um, be dangerous for them if the persecutors could understand what was written. The description in a couple of chapters time will be of a dragon being hurled down from heaven and a beast appearing from the sea along with another from the land. Wow, that really does set the scene for what's to come. It's another cliffhanger and I'm going to leave you hanging on for a bit. But for now, let's concentrate a bit more on chapter 10. Well, I bet many of you have been enjoying the tennis this week. You know that the umpire's decision is final, don't you? If the umpire believes the ball is out, then it's out, even if the line judge says something else. It's the umpire who decides if it's a foot fault or not, and so on. Now, over the years, players have had some spirited disagreements with umpires about all this stuff. The most famous of all surely being John McEnroe, in 1981 with his you cannot be serious tirade. But here's the thing, a player can protest as much as they want, but once the umpire calls it, it's a thing. It's the reality. In, out, second service, foot fault, game, set and match, if the umpire says it, it is. The idea of speaking words to create a new reality isn't a modern one. It's as old as God himself. Just think of the creation narratives. God said, let there be light. And there was. It's well summed up, actually, in one of the Psalms, Psalm 33. 
By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The same thing happened when God gave words to his prophets. They spoke and a new reality was created. In this chapter, John is transformed from a visionary into a prophet. As Tom Wright says, this now puts John into the hot seat. There are new things yet to happen as part of God's purposes and John's words will bring them to pass. Remember the little scroll in the mighty angel's hand? John is told to go and take it from the angel and to eat it. What a vivid metaphor, but it's a good one. Prophets can only speak God's word if it has become part of their life. And the angel warns John that the scroll will be both sweet to his lips and sour to his stomach. How true is that? God's word can be in season and sweet or out of season and sour or more usually both at the same time. Well, God has always desired there to be obedient humans to act on his behalf and to prophesy his word and bring fresh order to the world. Here, it's John that's to shoulder that awesome responsibility. However, I think this passage speaks to us. Part of being co-workers with Christ requires us to witness to God's plans, what he's already done, as well as the work still to do. Think justice, peace, love, grace, forgiveness and the like. So as I finish this first talk, I want to leave you with a couple of questions for you to ponder. One, right at the moment, which parts of God's message seem sweet and acceptable to the world? And which parts seem difficult or sour for the world to hear? And two, how might God be calling you specifically to eat and then bear witness to his message today? And we sing again, majesty, worship his majesty.
The second reading comes from chapter 13 of Revelation, verses 1 to 4 and 11 to 18. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns and written on each head were names that blasphemed God. The beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marvelled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast? they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that everyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Do you enjoy a good parody film? I like them, from the ridiculous airplane or Johnny English to Hot Fuzz and the like, and we kind of know where we are with such movies. They are obviously ridiculous, hilarious, and we can see them for what they are. More troubling are film parodies that present themselves as fact. Indeed, they have a genre all of their own, and the name of this genre is a mashup between fact and fiction, and so the genre is called faction. And the film that comes to mind most readily for me in this genre is Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. It's a fictional tale about the search for the legendary Holy Grail. The problem was that some of its detail was close enough to be feasible. And so some people began to believe what they were seeing. And at the time, the Catholic Church in particular got a lot of unmerited stick from what was portrayed on screen. Think also about Netflix, The Crown, a similar situation there. The problem with deceptions such as these is that if you mislead enough people, then the parody runs the risk of becoming the new reality. Well, that was the situation in John's day and chapter 13 speaks right into that. John and his readers knew who the real all sovereign sitting on the throne room of history, God was. They knew that his son, the lamb, had triumphed through sacrifice. 
And they knew all this, not least because John's vision detailed it in the earlier chapters. A parody, however, was playing out and gaining traction in real time all around John. What was that dangerous parody? Well, it was the Roman Empire and the emperor at the head of it was being portrayed as the ultimate world leader and a figure to be worshipped and adored as if a deity. So we have chapter 13, which talks about two ferocious beasts that operate at the behest of a dragon which came down from the sky, all of which was introduced in the preceding chapter. Now, I know this is sounding really weird, but bear with me. Remember that this is coded language and that everything means something in Revelation. It will all make sense in a moment, I promise you. Although some of the characters in Revelation can be hard to identify, John doesn't lead us guessing very long with the dragon. The dragon has been thrown out of heaven after the battle there and is the devil, Satan, the accuser, whatever you want to call him. And even though the decisive war has been won and the lamb has completely overcome him, the devil's nature continues to drive him ever more frantically, as one commentator wrote, to the attack, to accuse where it's justified and where it isn't, to drag down, to slander, to vilify, to deny the truth of what the creator God and his son, the lamb, have accomplished and are accomplishing. And how does the devil do this? Through others, that's how he does it. Indeed, the dark forces of this world usually work through intermediaries and the devil particularly works through others who are believable enough to seem credible. And if enough people believe them, then there's a danger of it becoming a new reality. Cue the two beasts. The first beast from the water is there to represent Rome and all the evil hubris that the Roman Empire represented. There are even a few verses that talk about one of the beast's heads receiving a fatal wound, but then that wound being healed. <clears throat> well, I can tell you that this was a jibe at what was going on at the time. Emperor Nero had been killed, but there were rumours abounding that he still lived, and people believed these lies. I couldn't help but see the parallels between that and some of the Trump supporters who have been conditioned into a dangerous new reality which elevates Trump to some cult status. There are those who believe he's still in power and anything that would suggest otherwise they would call fake news. Then there's the second beast from the land but subordinate to the first one. This beast represents the local elites who not only try to emulate their master but also try to curry favour with them as well, along with wanting everyone else in their domain to do the same. I wonder what international, national or local regimes these beasts bring to mind for you. What happens in the world, in this country or closer to home, what happens in those places which is not of God's purposes? What evil is perpetrated rather than overcome? I have a horrible feeling we can all think of many examples. It was tough times for the Christians at the time of writing. There are a few verses in the middle of the chapter that note the persecution that was meted out to those who chose a different path away from worshipping the emperor. John's early Christian readers are told to wait with patience, endurance and faithfulness for the fulfilment of the promise of the Lamb. This isn't an ancient thing. It can be the same story for people today. As we gaze out at our broken world and the beasts that rise up, we too wait in hope and expectation whilst fulfilling our call to worship and to witness for Christ. I can't really finish this talk without mentioning the last verse, the 666, the mark of the beast. 
So much has been said about this over the years. People have turned cartwheels, trying to make that number mean something that it doesn't. Actually, to understand it, we need to return to where we started, with parody. You see, perfection in the Bible is communicated with the number seven. So it follows that 777 seven, seven would be utter perfection. But for John, the Roman emperors and the systems they represented were but a pound shop parody of the real thing. 666 six, six was their number. One number short of perfection, not once, but three times over. Jesus was and is the reality. Rome, the emperors, and any evil regime since, just a dangerous copy. Amen. Our third hymn is May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. Is a response to these prayers for others today. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, could you respond, hear our prayer? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. We pray for your church today, gathering all around the world to praise you and to hear your holy word. Give us a sense of expectation as we come and inspiration as we go. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for a world which struggles to live justly and in peace. We pray for those who have to search for daily food or walk long distances for clean water. We remember with sadness those whose lives are cut short by disease or violence and those who have fled their homes in fear. We pray for those who meet persecution and torture with courage and dignity. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
we thank you for those people who sustain us by their love and forgiveness. Thank you for the network of people with whom our lives are linked and who make up the fabric of our family and community life. Make us alert to each other's needs and quick to serve and encourage one another. May our gentleness with each other reflect your gentleness with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are laid low by suffering and those who are experiencing the outrageous assault of pain. We trust your love for us and for all people and your deep desire for our well-being. As we name in our hearts those who are in the grip of suffering, help us so to pray and act that they may know your comfort and healing both now and in the coming days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for those people who have given us the examples and models by which we try to live. We thank you for those who have lived and died in quiet holiness and whose prayers has helped to sustain the world. Help us to live in the light by which they lived and to worship the source of that light, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our final hymn. The splendour of the King. How great is our God.
May the world continue to surprise us. Love continue to astonish us. Life continue to captivate us. Faith continue to sustain us. And may God go with us always, now and forevermore. Amen.